have you all here with us today. As we address the historical perspectives on Black maternal health disparities hosted by Wayside Recovery Center, I would like to give a special thank you to DHS for funding this event. My name is Najoycia Elmore. I am the Director of Training at Wayside Recovery Center, and I will be your moderator for this portion of the event today. We are so excited that the time has come to continue this education series focused on reducing maternal and infant health disparities. The disparities in maternal infant health in Minnesota and across the nation are the predictable outcomes of healthcare system. Studies show black women are three to four times more likely to die from pregnancy related out outcomes or complications than white women. In fact, there is a dark history associated with the origins of OBGYN care in this country and the legacy of that mistreatment continues down to the present day. This afternoon, we will begin by taking a deeper dive into the historical perspectives of Black maternal health with a presentation by CEO of Wayside, Ruth Richardson, followed by a few amazing women, Dr. LaVon Moore, Brittany Wright, and Katina R., who are women with lived experiences related to maternal health and who are actively working in community addressing maternal disparities and outcomes. There will be a brief Q&A session after each presentation as we go on. So please feel free to put any of your questions in the Q&A box that will be monitored by Nicole Fernandez. I would like to begin today by introducing our first presenter, Ruth Richardson followed immediately by her presentation, Framing the Intersection of Chattel Slavery and the History of Reproductive Medicine, along with the impact of medical racism on Black birthing people. Ruth Richardson serves as CEO of Wayside Recovery Center. She has worked for over two decades to advance equity and human rights. Formerly, she served as a director of programs and national strategic initiatives for the Minnesota Organization on Fetal Alcohol Syndrome, and as the City of St. Paul's Deputy Director of Human Rights and Equal Economic Opportunity. In addition to her work with Wayside Recovery Center, she serves in the Minnesota House of Representatives and served as chief author of House Resolution 1 a bipartisan initiative to justice, for which she served as co-chair and co-authored a legislative report with input from the community with 83 recommendations advancing racial equity in the state of Minnesota. She has earned her undergraduate degrees in sociology and history from the University of Minnesota, Minnesota Twin Cities and her JD from William Mitchell College of Law. I wanna thank you all again for joining and I will now turn it over to Ruth Richardson. Thank you. Thank you, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for giving us a piece of your afternoon. Uh, and thank you, Joy, for the kind uh, introduction. So I come from a long line of, of storytellers and I wanted to start off this uh, conversation by grounding us in some of the stories to ensure that we remember behind the statistics and behind the data that we hear related to the maternal mortality and morbidity crisis that we experience, not only in Minnesota, but in this nation, that these are uh, real stories about real people. So the, the photo on, on the screen, uh, this is a photo of my, my mother and it's my oldest brother uh, that are pictured here in, in the photo. Mm -hmm. And the work that I do around addressing equity and the work that I do around uh, reproductive justice was really instilled in me as a very young child. And it was instilled in me because of the stories that I heard from my mom. And I remember um, being in elementary school and there was this project of where we were all telling our, our birthing stories. And so I'm talking with my mom to learn more. And what I noticed about her birthing stories were they were filled with um, uh, traumatic experiences. They, they were not filled with like funny, like joyous stories, but there was a lot of pain. 
The one story that she told me that um, has stuck with me uh, through the years was she talked about how um, for her family um, who grew up as a very poor family. Um, I am one generation removed from the, the brutal system of sharecropping. My grandparents were sharecroppers. My mom grew up in Mississippi working in the cotton fields. Um, and uh, when she uh, was pregnant with, my, with my, uh, my older brother, she used a midwife. And there were complications as a result of that. And so with her second pregnancy, she made the decision that she was going to have a hospital birth. So she tells a story of her second pregnancy where she's laboring on the table, she's in the hospital. Uh, there's a nurse at her side and there are two um, white male doctors that are sitting at the foot of her bed. They're standing and they're having a conversation. Um, my sister's head starts to crown. The nurse interrupts the doctors and she says, uh, doctor, the, the baby is coming. We need your help. The doctor, frustrated that this nurse would interrupt him, um, turns and says, we're not ready yet and pushes the head of my sister back in the birth canal. My mom said that the pain that she experienced in that moment was excruciating. And she said it was the worst pain that she had ever experienced um, in, in, in her lifetime. But she also said something that was very, very chilling. She said, you know, that pain actually probably saved my life because if I had had the ability to get off the table at that moment and retaliate, I would have. And as a black woman in segregated Mississippi, retaliating against a white doctor would have likely ended in death. And when she told me this story as a little girl, I was, I was, I was shocked by it. And I was telling her how I couldn't believe that this happened to her. And what she shared with me was that what happened to her was not a unique experience. And she talked about the fact that she had uh, other people in her family and other women who had experienced similar treatment of having the baby's head pushed back in the birth canal. The um, beautiful woman pictured here is my, my late auntie Katie. Um, my mom's sister. And Katie had the exact same experience happen to her. But in that circumstance, her daughter, um, her daughter died as a result. And with that, it became very clear as she was talking about this um, mistreatment that she and her sisters and her mother and other individuals had, um, had uh, been a part of was something that was, it was common. It was not, it was not exceptional. So when I heard those stories and as I came of age and um, had my, my own pregnancies, I expected it to be different. I expected different outcomes. And when I began to experience similar issues of not being heard by medical uh, professionals, um, being mistreated, uh, the stigma, being looked down upon, not receiving the care that you need when you're asking for it, I had my own experience and thought, wow, not much has changed. We're still seeing the impacts of, of, of racism as we think about uh, maternal health care. And I wanted to believe that surely for the next generation, it was going to be, it was going to be better. The woman pictured here is my cousin, uh, Keandria. And I want to, before I tell you a little bit about her, I want to share um, uh, this video that um, uh, shows the excitement that she and her husband had when they were expecting their first, uh, their first child. We're going to keep your glass over. I got to eat. What you got to eat? I'm about to eat. What are you doing? Well, hello, beautiful. And you are beautiful. You must be Daniel's mama. Daniel, this is your mom. Today is April 20th, 2015. 
Lord willing, you'll be here in another three months. And what? Hi, I'm your dad. Your mom is very pretty. See? And there you are. You're More. like somewhere in all this. More in this area. I'm sorry it's taking this long for uh, your smart dad to add his bright idea to document your life. But I never had these things because I was born before cameras were created. In the dinosaur ages. Yep. Smile for your son. Do you have a, a special message for Daniel? Your mom's trying to feed you. <laughs> and, yeah, on me. All right, talk to you next time. So, um, a little over a month and a half after that video was uh, taken, uh, Keandria went into early term labor. On June 27th, uh, she delivered her son, uh, Daniel, and she began to have complications uh, shortly after that birth. She um, complained to doctors. She um, shared with her, her mom how something wasn't right. And on July 7th, the last uh, text message communication that went from her to um, her mom, um, she said, mom, I feel like I'm dying. She was admitted into the hospital on July 7th. Uh, she slipped into a coma and she died. Uh, Keandria was 26 years old. She was bright, educated, had a bright future ahead of her. She had earned her uh, master's in uh, business administration. And just like that, she was gone. And what we often don't talk about is the impact of losing someone in a way that is preventable and the impact on survivors and how, and how they act and they respond to future pregnancies. And so Keandra um, was a granddaughter of my auntie Katie. And so as I was preparing for this presentation, I was thinking about the fact that just the snapshot of three generations within my family, there are these stories of, of loss and it's just a snapshot because there are more babies that didn't make it to their first birthday. There are others who have lost their life. And I just think it's really important that as we go into the origins of understanding more about how we got to the system that we have with the uh, disparities that we have, that we're talking about real people and we're talking about real pain that's behind this data. So I, I want to um, shift gears here a little bit and to get to um, the, the focus of today's talk around really understanding the intersections between uh, slavery with uh, gynecology and also the legacy of medical racism that continues to be felt down to the present day. And what we know uh, in terms of the way that the field evolved, it's that enslaved Black women and their bodies sped up the developments within the, gyneco uh, the gynecology field. And there are some really, I think, important dates that um, help to set some context and some foundation for what we're going to talk about today. And I think it's really important to understand that when we talk about um, black chattel slavery, that was a form of slavery that um, followed the idea that an individual would be enslaved for life. And back in uh, colonial times in colonial uh, Virginia, there was a law passed in 1662, partis sequitur ventrum, uh, that law basically, um, uh, that Latin translates into that which is born follows the, uh, follows the womb. 
And so basically it was a legal doctrine that uh, basically said the status of the mother would determine the status of the child. And that was important for um, Black women who were enslaved because it basically meant any child born to a Black enslaved woman would have the uh, enslaved status as well. And this was a major departure from common English, English law because under English law, the child status always followed the father. And even if um, a child was born um, illegitimate, there was still this idea Idea that the father would be um, responsible uh, for any offspring uh, financially. So with this idea that the mother's status determines the status of the child, it also meant that um, white slave owners could father babies and have no um, and have no economic. Um, uh, qualifications or requirements thrust upon them because the status followed um, the, the mother. And this really ties into the fact around the economic engine that, um, that fueled slavery because there was a, a necessity that began that tied increasing the, in birth, the birth rates of enslaved black, black women because in 1808, the African slave trade was banned in the United States. And so with uh, the international slave trade uh, banned, what that really meant is that if this was going to continue as a system, it was going to need to continue through uh, the birth of black babies to black enslaved uh, women. So as we think about the building blocks of the structures and the institutions that were built, they were really designed to increase the birth rates of enslaved black, black women and to ensure healthy uh, births because that was the only way to continue to have the exploitation of labor continue. So I want to pause for a really quick moment. I want to take a quick poll. Um, and so the, the um, I want to give you all a, a moment to answer this first uh, poll question. Are you familiar with Dr. James Marion Sims experience, experiments on enslaved women, Anarka, Westcott, Betsy, Lucy, and nine other uh, uh, unnamed enslaved women and girls? I'll give you all a moment to, um, to vote there. All right, looks like we've got a critical mass of people um, responding. So um, about 39% of you um, uh, said yes, 61% of you said no. I'm going to add another poll here quickly. So this is a true or false question. And for those of you who are familiar uh, with Sims, um, this may be uh, something that you know about. For those who are not familiar, um, you may have a, a question about this as well. But true or false, Dr. Sims was the architect of the misguided race-based medicine notion that Black people did not feel pain the same way that whites experienced pain. Give you another five seconds or so here to see if you can get your responses logged. Okay, so um, this is what our attendees believe. So 95% um, uh, of attendees say that that is true and 5% say that that is uh, that that's false. So before we get into talking about Sims a little bit more, what I really want um, one of the major takeaways to be from today's talk, a lot of people have really um, framed uh, uh, Sims as you know this idea of 
being a medical monster with the brutal experiments that he performed on black women without um, anesthesia. But with what we know, Sims comes into what was already sorting, sort of an existing medical complex. He um, begins his work in a system that had already been designed and built with anti-Blackness and racial animus um, at the core. And it's really important to understand, just like in the very beginning when I talked about the way that um, my mom and my aunt um, were, were treated in, in segregated Mississippi, um, Sims was not exceptional in terms of, the, of his beliefs around uh, Black people, around Black enslaved uh, women, or when you look at his treatment of enslaved women as well, because prior to him, there was this legacy of medical racism that already existed. And by about the 1840s, when he comes into practice, there's already two centuries worth of racial science that is out there. And it's been built upon a foundation of ideas about Black inferiority, um, and also a lot of other misconceptions about race. And so when we think about um, some of those ideas, things like, for example, that Black people have biologic, like they're biologically different to white people, Black people have thicker skin, or they don't experience pain, and that Black women don't experience pain um, in childbirth, those are ideas that didn't start with Sims, and they also don't end with him either. And it's really, um, you know, chilling and shocking to know that even today, as we look at medical students, residents, and doctors, these ideas about Black people being biologically different to white people continue to persist, uh, persist down to the, the, the present day, including the ideas that Black people don't experience pain in the same way um, as, as white people. There's ideas that Black people's uh, blood coagulates more, um, or that Black people age more slowly than white people. Um, has come out within the last couple of years in terms of looking at the understandings of, of again, medical school students and residents and also doctors um, are also, uh, there was also people who believed that Black people had tails. And this is Today, we're not talking about something that happened a long time ago or within the 19th century. And so it's really important just to understand that these ideas don't start with Sims, they don't end with him, but they influence um, the work, uh, they influence the work that he has done, and it and continues to have impacts down to the present day. And so before we get to Sims and we talk more about uh, some of the truly brutal experiments that he performed on enslaved women, I want to share a little bit of context around some of the ideas around uh, Black women, around enslaved women that uh, shape the system um, in which Sims was practicing. So these are names that you may not have necessarily heard of before. Um, you know, many people have heard about Sims, but people might know less about uh, folks like George uh, Cuvier. Um, and George uh, Cuvier, he's really known for his experimentation on the cadaver of Sarti uh, Bartman in the 19th century. And although this happens in France, it has huge implications within the US, and we'll talk about that within a moment. And then there's people like Ephraim Madal. He's known as the father of the ovariotomy. Uh, John Peter uh, Matower, he was um, an early pioneer of the surgery that Sims becomes uh, uh, you know, popular for, the obstetric fistula uh, surger, uh, sur surgical repair. And he did this years before um, uh, Sims, and also the experiments were on um, enslaved women. 
Uh, he is also uh, known as the father of plastic surgery. And then there's uh, Francois Marie Provost. He was born in France, um, moved um, to Haiti after finishing uh, med school. And he starts experiments on enslaved women in Haiti, really trying to perfect uh, the C-section. And after, well, right before the um, Haitian Revolution, he knows that he needs to leave Haiti. And so um, he gets out prior to the Haitian Revolution. He moves to another former French colony he, uh, in Louisiana. And he continues to do the same um, sort of experiments on enslaved bla uh, Black women trying to perfect uh, the C-section. And when we talk about, you know, thinking about the ways that our, the foundations of our systems have been built and how, that does, how those designs Designs can impact the present day. What's really interesting is during the 19th and the 20, um, within the 19th and 20th century, um, Louisiana had the highest number of C-sections performed on Black women in the United States. And even within the 21st century, uh, Louisiana is still in the top three states in terms of the number of C-sections that are performed on Black, on, on Black women. And so it's just really important to understand that when we uh, talk about Sims and his work and his experiments on Black women, that he is a cog in the wheel of a system that had been developed and it had been built on a foundation of, of, of racism. And that legacy is, is, is continuing uh, to this day. So I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about um, each of these individuals in turn because they had a huge impact on the way that OBGYN care within uh, the United States um, developed. So um, Georges Cuvet, uh, although his, again, his research began in France, it had a really lasting impact um, in, in America uh, because his treatment of Sarti Bartman really created a template for mistreatment of enslaved Black women as the field of gynecology was beginning to um, develop. And um, many of the ideas that were already available within kind of the medical system complex came through with his um, experimentations on, on Bartman because it was people were inferior um, it was about seeing blackness as being pathological. And with that, it also, there came these thoughts about black people as other, like not as humans, um, being compared uh, to, to animals. And within an OBGYN context, that lens and that frame, that template for mistreatment really begins um, with Cuvier. So Cuvier um, and all of the white medical men I'm going to talk about today, they all were slaveholders. So um, Cuvier, he gains uh, possession of Sarti Bartman um, about three years before she dies. She's about 22. Um, she passed, uh, she dies at 25. Um, there's speculation around the cause of her death, um, and there was speculation that it could have been from an alcohol uh, addiction. So um, Bartman was born in uh, South Africa. She is a she was a member of the Khoi Khoi people, and Bartman was sold several times um, uh, into slavery, including to an individual. Um, who was an animal trainer and had a menagerie or what we would consider today a zoo. And so he uh, displays um, Bartman in this, uh, this zoo um, along with animals. And uh, what, what, what happens is you have a situation where Bartman is brutally robbed of her humanity She's treated horribly. She's uh, sexually exploited. And all of this occurs because she looks different. And the way in which she looks different is, I mean, basically she, um, she, has, a, she has a big butt and 
within the, the medical realm, her condition becomes uh, pathologized. Um, they give it a term, they call it steel, steel pegia, um, basically a condition that results in the enlargement of the buttocks. But if you look at Bartman in relationship to other koi koi uh, women, there was nothing that was truly exceptional about, um, about, about Bartman, but the way that she's treated, again, this idea of you know, black people as other, this image from the 18th century shows how that othering could play out in terms of, of the, the, the gazes that you can see here. And there's this whole idea at one, on one hand, you can see sort of this attraction um, to her. And on the other hand, there's also this like repulsion um, to her as well. And she is a woman that during life, she can't escape this gaze because she's on display um, at this zoo. But even within death, she was not able to um, escape this gaze because, um, you know, Cuvier, who um, gained uh, possession of her after, um, after her death, he had this idea that um, Bartman was the missing link between um, humans and primates. And so he um, decides to dissect her, uh, her body because he wants to prove that she's the missing link. And so what he does is he, um, he cuts off her genitalia, he preserves it and puts it in a jar. He does the same thing um, with her brain. Um, he displays her skeleton, uh, displays her other organs, and a cast of her body is, um, and a cast of her body is created. And in all of this work that he was doing, what he finds um, after he dissects uh, Bartman's body is that she was no different than any other than any other woman. But with that the idea of you have someone who cannot escape a gaze even within death. Um, Bartman dies in the early um, uh, uh, 18, 1800s, but her, her, her brain, her genitalia, the um, casts of her body, they stay um, on display in the Natural History of Museum in France until 1974. And so again, as we talk about sort of the template that um, begins to work in, it starts from an OBGYN perspective um, as seeing black women's bodies as uh, different, other, not human, and also um, as teaching tools. And that um, even in death, you're not worthy of a burial um, we need to learn, um, we need to learn from you. So Ephraim McDowell, um, so Ephraim uh, McDowell was known as the father of the ovariotomy. And uh, again, slave owning physician, he comes from a pretty elite, uh, rich family. And in and, and Kentucky, he does something in 1809 that no one has ever done before. And this is actually uh, a patient, he has a white woman patient um, who has an ovarian tumor. He removes a 21 pound ovarian tumor uh, from this woman who was in her late thirties. And to do this type of surgery was unheard of at the time. And in fact, when um, he did this surgery, they did it in secret. Um, he did it in his home. They didn't want anyone to know it was happening because um, there was uh, fear that there could be retribution. But um, this woman survives um, su uh, surprisingly and um, ends up living in, into her um, early 70s. And it's considered to be the first successful um, abdominal surgery in the Western uh, in the Western world, and McDowell, when this when this occurs, he he wants to perfect this because he's like, hey, if we can perfect this, um, this could help put 
uh, this new nation uh, of America on, on, on the map. So he begins to collect cases. And the cases that he collects, it's enslaved Black women. So he's leasing um, Black women from other uh, slave owners um, within uh, Kentucky. And he gets uh, a group of five uh, women. Four of them are enslaved Black women. And one is a Black uh, woman who is described as a freed woman. And he, um, they all have uh, tumors. He does the surgeries. Um, all of them survive except uh, there is one woman um, who dies. So between 1809, 1817, he does these five uh, surgeries and perfects this procedure. So 1817, he's very excited to publish his work, again, thinking that this is going to be something that puts America on the, on the map. And the quote on the screen is from uh, Dr. Uh, Johnson, who was a British doctor. And when this, um, when his uh, research comes out, um, he's derided, people are, 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 are making fun of him. And what Dr. James Johnson says is that, well, all the women that he operated on in Kentucky, except one, uh, he describes them as negresses. And he says that they will bear cutting with nearly, if not quite, as much impunity as dogs and rabbits. And so part of this idea of believing that um, Black people don't experience pain and that Black women don't experience pain really come up in these comments from Dr. Johnson. And this was, um, this was uh, published in the Lancet, which was a leading uh, medical journal uh, of the day and is still a leading medical uh, journal now. And the, the fact that there's also this comparison of Black women with like animals, dogs and rabbits, um, animals that breed quickly, they breed in litters. It's like, it gives you an idea of how um, uh, the medical establishment that were made up of white men were seeing and were viewing um, black enslaved women uh, and their bodies. Um, Moving on to John Peter uh, Matower. So his work was really um, in around the 1830s, again, from a very elite family, also um, a, a slave uh, owner as well. He did the same uh, sort of obstetrical fistula surgery that Sims um, is known for. And for those who aren't familiar uh, with um, obstetric fistula, it's basically caused by a traumatic birthing experience. So when there's a prolonged birth, and we're, you're talking about a, a prolonged birth, not, not talking about hours, at this point you're talking about days, um, as you have uh, an individual trying to um, expel the, 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 the fetus, it can cause friction. And over time that can create holes or tearing. And while the condition itself is not uh, life-threatening, it does cause things like incontinence. And for an enslaved woman, um, to experience an obstetric fistula, it would actually result in her um, an, a, a decrease like in the value, because again, we're talking about uh, this work in the time of, of slavery and that you would look at uh, black bodies and you would assign uh, a dollar uh, value to it. There was also a social ostracism that would be a result of having this condition because it would cause incontinence. And so um, the smell, the infections, those could be things that could uh, lead to social um, rejection and, and isolation um, as as well. And so um, Matower uh, does a race-based uh, uh, clinical trial on, you know, trying to uh, uh, fix or cure um, obstetric uh, fistulas in one, uh, an enslaved Black woman, and then he also does the surgery on a white woman as well. And when the surgeries are completed, um, he tells both of the women that you need to be, you need to rest. 
because when um, you'll rest and, and then uh, hopefully the words he uses is that you'll be uh, cured. So the, the white woman rests and he uh, talks about her and his uh, research as being cured. And then he um, goes on to talk about the enslaved black woman and the fact that he does um, eight clinical trials with her. He goes, he does this uh, procedure eight times and he gets really frustrated at the end because he says, um, I've done this eight times now and the black woman is still not cured. And what he does within that moment, and you know, this is within the American uh, uh, Journal of Medical Sciences, his, his words are, are captured. He says, the patient could have been cured in a matter of time had she stopped engaging in sexual intercourse. And so this idea of blaming an enslaved woman um, is one that really uh, is an interesting co uh, concept because you know we don't we don't talk about you know at this time they weren't talking about uh, social determinants of health um, you know in the 1840s but if we were to talk about this in today's time we would say you're not taking into account the fact that slavery is a social determinant of health and the fact that um, uh, a black um, enslaved woman did not have control over her body. She could be forcibly, uh, she could be forcibly raped with no recourse uh, for that. Um, there is, the, there was no sort of understanding around the fact that even as an enslaved black woman going through a clinical trial, this idea of you need to rest. Um, when enslaved women were going through these clinical trials, it did not mean that they got to actually rest and, and not work the fields or in the homes of the individuals um, who owned them. So um, next I wanna talk a little bit about Sims um, and you know, Sims is someone who is known as the father of American gynecology, um, and he gets that uh, he gets that moniker um, after after death. But Sims um, is is definitely influenced by the individuals who came before him. Um, Sims reads uh, Matower's uh, uh, research, his articles, and the the surgeries that he did were about 10 years before Sim starts to do uh, the, the similar um, uh, surgeries. Uh, Sim started his career in South Carolina. Um, he was also a slave owning uh, physician um, as well. He did not come from a much more uh, modest uh, background. And after he gets his medical degree and begins to do work in South Carolina, he has um, two uh, black infants that are patients of his die. And with the two black infants dying, his reputation within South Carolina is ruined. Um, no one is going to uh, go to him again because he's had two black infants die. And we know that the, the value that black bodies have in terms of uh, perpetuating the system of exploitation uh, with slave labor. So he's forced to move in order to try to restart his career. So with that, he moves to Alabama and um, within time, he, uh, he starts uh, his practice working on uh, poor um, uh, white people. And what he talks about in his memoir is also um, uh, poor black people that he describes as the N-word. And over time, he starts to build up his reputation and he begins to get contracts um, with slave owners. So there was uh, one of these slave owners that he had a contract with, had an enslaved woman who had um, an obstetric uh, fistula. And so they send her uh, a long distance to go to Sims with the hope that he can help. She arrives, 
he tells her that he can't help her. Um, and she's traveled a long way. And uh, because her plantation um, that she uh, is at is, uh, is far away, that she has to stay the night. Um, that night, there's a white patient um, who, falls from, uh, who falls from a horse. The individual is in extreme pain. Um, they bring her to Sims and he asks if she'll consent to, um, an, to, to a vaginal exam because in, in that time period, it wasn't, uh, wasn't often that you would have um, male doctors performing these types of examinations. And so he gets her consent uh, to examine her and he, um, he describes her as having a uterus that's been turned upside down and that it needs to be retroversed. Now, for any medical professionals that are on the line, these are Sim's words, not mine. Um, but he, um, he writes in his, his memoir of this white patient and he refers to her as Miss Morell. And he talks about how he remembers a lecture from his medical school that if you open up uh, the vaginal cavity wide enough, a rush of air will turn the uterus right side up. So in his memoir, he writes like that's what he does. And uh, he writes that she lets out the sound of flatulence. She's really embarrassed, but she's healed of her pain. And what happens within that moment and seeing that, um, that, that, that white patient, it gets Sims thinking about the enslaved woman patient that he had just told earlier that he couldn't help her. And he began to think, well, what if I can open up the vaginal cavity wide enough? And um, what he wrote within his memoir was, if he could open the, the cavity wide enough, he could peer in in order to see what no man has ever seen before. Things as clear as the tip of my nose. And so what Sims does is he uses uh, two uh, pewter spoons and it's, sort of the makings of what um, becomes the sim speculum uh, later. Um, and some of you may have heard about the sim speculum. Um, it's been in the news uh, recently because there's some doctors that would like to uh, rename it. But he uses those spoons to examine this enslaved uh, uh, woman. And he's able to see the fistula. He's able to see the hole, the tearing, and, and where the incontinence is happening. And with this, he begins to collect cases. And so um, much like the uh, previous men who came before him uh, within this field, he goes to other slave um, holders and he leases um, enslaved, enslaved women. And this idea of leasing, um, you know, uh, Black people during slavery was really common. Um, Harriet Tubman was 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 leased when she was just uh, when she was just six years old, and when you think about this this concept of of leasing um, as well, it was really tied to the fact that if you had the ability to cure or to fix um, uh, some of these gynecological issues, it helped to again run that economic uh, engine. Of, of, of slavery as well, because there is a clear desire to continue to um, increase the number of healthy uh, Black babies born so that they can contribute uh, to, uh, to, this, uh, to this system. So what's pictured here is um, uh, a hospital that was built by the um, uh, enslaved uh, uh, folks that um, lived on, on Sims uh, plantation. So Sims developed the first hospital in the nation that was dedicated to women's health. And it was built for enslaved women as he began to undertake these um, uh, experiments. And many of you have heard the names of Anarka 
uh, Betsy and Lucy. They're the three named uh, Black enslaved women that Sims talks about um, in his research, his work, and within his uh, memoirs. But there are also nine other unnamed um, enslaved women that lived and worked together within this hospital between 1844 and 1849. Mm -hmm. I will say that this photo is, um, it was actually taken in the 18 um, in the 1890s, which was much uh, uh, past that date. But this uh, this um, uh, slave hospital uh, was in Mount Meigs, uh, Alabama, and it was the first hospital in the nation that was dedicated to women's uh, to women's health. And Sims in his memoir talks about it as a hospital um, uh, as, as, as well. And what's really interesting within between the between the time of 1844 and 1849, when Sims is uh, doing all of these um, these experiments on on black women. Uh, some of you may have heard um, that Anarka, for example, um, she endured more than thirty surgeries, you know, without um, anesthesia. Um, the first couple of years, the first two and a half years that Sims is trying to um, perfect this uh, procedure and this surgery, he's failing. He's failing miserably, and he has white male surgical assistants that are working with them, and um, they quit. They 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 walk off. They they no longer want to uh, work with him. And what is often not known is that when he lost all of his white male surgical assistants he began to train the enslaved Black women who were also patients to serve as surgical um, assistants. And I think it's also worth noting that um, Sims did not succeed in perfect uh, the um, obstetric fistula uh, uh, surgery until he was surrounded by a team of enslaved black women who were working as his nurses and as his surgical um, uh, assistants. And what's really um, you know, interesting about that is we don't spend a lot of time talking about the fact that these um, enslaved black, black women who were patients were also trained um, within this way. But in 1849, um, after the experiments ended, you know, Sims, his, his uh, profile explodes. He publishes his work, um, his career takes off, and he moves to New York and he um, founds the New York um, State Hospital for Women. And what's very interesting is that that hospital uh, that's founded by Sims after all of these experiments have happened within Alabama are talked about as the first hospital for women in the country. So this is where we start to see um, Black women from um, the, the narrative in terms of understanding the roots of, of uh, OBGYN care. And What's also, I think, very uh, helpful to understand and also interesting as well is that um, the, this erasure of Black women, like for example, saying that the New York hospital for, um, that was set up for white women was the first hospital and, and, and you know, forgetting about um, all of the enslaved Black women who were part of his hospital within Alabama. In Sims' writing, in his memoirs, in his published uh, articles and research, he doesn't erase Black women um, or the fact that they were enslaved from his writing. Um, but when you begin to uh, look at the photos, like the photo that is, uh, there's a clip of it here. This is actually a commemorative article talking about uh, Sims. All of a sudden, you have the Black enslaved patients they're replaced with a white patient. You have the enslaved black nurses um, uh, 
replaced with a, a white a white nurse. And you also begin to see these ideas of the politics of respectability coming in um, as well and sort of rewriting history because you see here like the woman is clothed. I mean, she's got, you know, she's even got shoes on here. Uh, but when Sims was doing uh, his experiments in Alabama, those were those were public events that throngs of people could come and watch and see um, as you know black nurses and surgical assistants worked alongside of him and the enslaved women who were being operated and experimented on they were naked and so you begin to see how history sort of um, uh, begins to uh, erase uh, black women from uh, the narrative and also uh, the experience. There's also a, a concerning erasure of the bioethical um, uh, issues that arise around uh, Sims um, experiments. Uh, you know, people talk about the um, the fact that these surgeries uh, were happening without anesthesia. It's also the reality that. Um, uh, individuals uh, could not consent when they were enslaved. Um, they could be forced uh, to have uh, these, these surgeries um, as well. But another important piece that I think is really important, and it goes back to um, work that has been done by the uh, Black woman uh, historian, Deidre Cooper um, Owens, when she was working on, on her book and looking at Sims and many of these other uh, players in terms of the evolution of OBGYN care in um, uh, America, she came across something within, uh, within census records that had been looked at lots of other times by other historians, but it took the eye of a Black woman to find something that other historians had not found. Um, she found that during the, um, during the trials and during the experiments, there was a Black woman slave who was um, uh, part of the, the trial who had been experimented on and she became um, pregnant during the uh, exper experiment and she gave birth um, to a mixed race child. She gave birth to a child that was half white. And so that raised a lot of questions around, um, uh, again, how these black enslaved women um, were, were being uh, treated because you know that if you're trying to uh, repair an opening and you're suturing things and you've heard that, you know, uh, providers say, well, you need to rest and not engage in, in sexual intercourse to have this um, enslaved woman give birth uh, to um, a mixed race child during the experimental trial uh, was something that it appears from the historical record also had an impact because it was around the same time that his white male surgical uh, assistants quit. And at that same time, Sims writes in his uh, memoir that the community in Alabama began to withdraw their support from uh, their support from him um, shortly before he uh, moved on to uh, New York. So there's all kinds of ethical uh, questions and bioethical uh, issues around the treatment of, of Black women within these experiments as well. And so as we fast forward to today, um, the statistics that uh, Joy talked about at the very beginning of the, of the opening, we know that Black women are three to four times more likely to die from pregnancy-related complications when compared to white women. And that's when you control for all the factors, um, income, uh, you know, familial status, insurance status, education status, um, substance use disorder status. And we also know that Black infants are twice as likely to die before their first birthday when compared to white infants. And we know now with um, 
really important data that's come out of the University of Minnesota with Dr. Rachel Hardiman that the infant mortality rate is cut in half when you have a black um, pediatrician with a black um, infant. And so what we what we know about this really concerning um, about this really concerning data is the fact that 60% um, of the deaths that we see are preventable. So there are things that we can do and there are ways that we can um, uh, address black women differently and black babies to get uh, different results. And I, you know, I, as, as we're coming to a close, because I want to make sure that we have some time for question, for questions, I, I also just want to lift up the fact that, you know, during slavery, there was a concerted effort, um, especially after the Atlantic, the, the African um, uh, slave trade was banned. There was a concerted effort to focus on perfecting techniques and to ensuring that there were healthy um, black uh, babies that were born. And in freedom, that changes because under the under slavery, black children, black babies, they were seen as assets, right? They were seen as property. And once um, you know, after the Emancipation Proclamation, Black children shift from being seen as assets to now being seen as financial burdens. And so with that, there's a shift from this idea of the slave masters having an economic stake in Black women's fertility. And you start to see um, efforts around um, sterilization abuses of, of Black women, which could be a whole nother uh, conversation um, of, its, of itself. But it's important to know that when we look at this data um, related to infant mortality uh, within um, Black infants, and when we look at the Black women's um, mortality and, and morbidity challenges, the stats have not been changing for decades. So this is not new. This has been going on and it's it's a real recognition uh, and it's a real uh, recognition of the impact of of medical racism and it's also a recognition that a piece of this puzzle is ensuring that there is um, uh, representation because it's not just about having diversity for diversity's sake, but that repres that representation can actually save um, can actually save lives. So thank you for um, uh, um, bearing with me uh, for for that uh, that quick overview to talk about the links. And at this point, we'll open it up for questions. Ruth, we have one question in um, the chat for you. What do you believe has changed or improved in Black maternal health? So I think um, in terms of what has improved, the data is still the data. So we still see, um, we still see that Black women are, are three to four infants twice as likely to die uh, before their 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 first um, birthday so the data is unchanging but I, I do think that there is uh, some hope in the fact that there are lots of states uh, cities counties that have begun to recognize um, racism as a public health crisis and have begun to talk about these disparities in a way that's actually accurate. Because when we think about um, a lot of the myths um, and uh, a lot of the misconceptions and many times when there are issues involving women, our first thought process is to blame women, right? So this whole idea of, of this enslaved woman not being able to heal, it's like, well, if she could just stop having intercourse, she could have been healed, but she wouldn't, she wouldn't stop that. And, and so 
um, we've gone through this idea that, well, the reason that we have these deep disparities is because, you know, um, uh, black women are overweight or um, they, they're poor or they don't have housing. And the, the research has really demonstrated that you can control for all those factors, right? Look at Beyonce Knowles, look at Serena Williams. You can control for all of those things. And it becomes clear that this is not something that we're gonna be able to buy our way out of. We're not gonna be able to educate our way out of it. And so that knowledge and understanding about the fact that we need to address racism as a public health crisis is, is, is something that gives hope. But just all that reminder that uh, hope is not a strategy. <laughs> um, and so we need to build on that in terms of actually having community-based responses. Thank you so much for that thorough answer. We'll have time for one more question. And that question is, how can communities use this information for better reproductive care? You know, I think one of the most important things that um, from a provider uh, perspective in terms of thinking about uh, what the, the research is showing us, what the data is showing us, what the case studies are showing us, we need to listen to Black women. When Black women are saying that they're in pain, we need to believe them. Um, we talk a lot about how there is dis like how the Black community has distrust of the medical establishment, um, but the medical establishment has a lot of distrust of the Black community um, as well. And to understand that so many of these deaths that have been preventable, um, they could have been prevented by taking a step back and listening to Black women when they're asking for help. Well, thank you, Ruth, um, for such a powerful presentation and also sharing such personal and powerful stories with us today. Um, it was really enlightening and really great response from everyone it looks like in the chat thank you everyone and welcome to part two i hope that you had a moment to maybe grab water uh, use the restroom and um, take care of yourself um, welcome to part two of today's event this portion will feature powerful stories about lived birth experiences a short presentation and a brief Q&A session. My name is Nicole Fernandez, Community Liaison and Project Manager of Maternal and Infant Health at Wayside Recovery Center. Najoycia Elmore will assist in monitoring the chat and the Q&A portion. I'd like to take this time to provide brief introductions of our speakers for this afternoon. Katina, in 2017, as a mother suffering from substance abuse disorder, who is now in recovery, she went through a traumatic birth to adoption experience and would like to share her story and how she was treated at the hospital during that experience. Brittany L. Wright is a social impact strategist, creative and Emmy nom nominated digital storyteller with a passion for creating culturally, culturally inclusive spaces for wellness in the nonprofit sector. Ms. Britt is a published writer, freelance journalist, DJ, and entrepreneur who fiercely advocates for equity in historically marginalized communities. Dr. LaVon Moore has a doctorate in nursing practice, is a certified nurse mid midwife, and a woman's health care nurse practitioner and a, bird, a board certified lactation consultant. She practices at North Point Health and Wellness Center. She is also the CEO and founder of Chosen Vessels Midwifery Services and the Chocolate Milk Club, a culturally specific service of Chosen Vessels Midwifery Service that provides breastfeeding education and support for African-American families. 
Her goal is to use the midwife model of care to inspire all women to breastfeed and support all those that do not because she believes that good health, health be, begins with breastfeeding. Our panelists now will take a little bit more time to share more about themselves, what, where they are in community and what brings them to this work. Thank you. Should I go ahead? Hi. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Katina. Um, I'm a person in long term recovery. And what that means to me is that I no longer choose to use drugs or alcohol as a solution to life's problems. Today, because of my recovery, I get to be a present mother. I get to work at a wonderful organization called Twin Cities Recovery Project as a certified peer recovery specialist. And I get to share my experience um, that I had with you all. Um, as uh, Ms. Fernandez said, I um, had a birthing experience in 2018. Um, I was living a life full of addiction and a uh, very fast uh, street life and ended up pregnant. Um, at the time I was, yes, um, situation. So I had chosen to do a private adoption agency for the child that I was pregnant with. Um, I was very honest with the adoption agency and um, I chose a closed adoption because I didn't know how my heart would take it at the time. Um, I kind of just wanted to push it away and pretend it didn't happen. But um, the hospital that I chose was informed of who I was before I even was supposed to be there. On the day I went into labor, I went to the hospital and I went there alone. And um, I went there alone because I didn't feel that I deserved to have anyone there at the time. Um, I felt that I put myself in a situation that I just didn't need, um, I just didn't deserve to have someone there. Um, when I got there, I um, was very upfront about who I was and let them know that they should know about me. And um, I told them that I had been using and immediately their demeanors changed. Um, the nurse that was checking me in was, uh, saying, we're not finding anything about you. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, they're just very cold, um, said, you know, we're gonna call social services on you, right? And it was so, it was so heartbreaking because it was like, you guys should already know about me. Like I, you guys were informed before I came. And for some reason, they just couldn't find me. And um, they left me in a room and were asking me questions like what made me think I was supposed to be there? Uh, what made me think that they should know about me? Um, I was fortunately able to get a hold of the adoption agency and um, let them know that I was having these troubles before things started to go uh, pretty bad. Um, they put me in a room and um, for two hours, I was alone in this room with a nurse and um, blacking out every time I had a contraction. Um, no one was helping me. And when I would say, I was hurt so bad, I keep blacking out. The one nurse. Yeah, that she was said it did when she took it, but then she started having some nausea. So. Um, <laughs> I asked the nurse there. Um, why is this happening? I keep blacking out and she just yells at me. She says, it's because of the meth. That's why. And I would literally would just lay around screaming in pain and blacking out and, and no one helped me for almost two hours. Um, finally, the doctor came in and, um, uh, asked, uh, said, oh, well, you know, it seems like you're a different person. Uh, than you were when you came in because they didn't understand why I was there because my contractions were starting to go lower, uh, to go down. But um, when they finally came back in and um, said, now we need to do an emergency C-section. 
And I was so upset about that, but I went with it obviously and signed it because that's what we had to do. And so after I gave birth to the baby, um, it wasn't, I thought it would be better, but it wasn't. Um, it's like the staff didn't have any communication about me at all. Um, I had nurses coming into my room asking me um, if I was gonna breastfeed, asking me, um, congratulations on your baby, what did you name him? And it's like they didn't even communicate about who I was or my experience. I did the, I had the C-section and I never saw my baby. Um, it went right to the adoptive parents. Um, it even went as far as when my um, cousin, I finally had someone come visit me, but I had my cousin come visit me and she asked for my room and they sent her to the adoptive family's room. Uh, they didn't send her to my room. So it being a closed adoption, you can imagine it was just a little bit like, whoa, like what's going on? And they sent her to the room and she walked in and luckily they're very wonderful people that they embraced her coming in and told her to tell me, thank you. Um, I was uh, told by a nurse that I had to walk down the hall and get up and move around um, at some point. And, and I told her I didn't want to walk by the nursery because I didn't, you know, I was at the time, I just didn't, I just want to pretend this didn't happen. And she told me that it, that's the only hallway that I could walk down and that I had to walk down that hallway. And so I'm walking down the hallway past the nursery, kind of like trying not to look, but looking. And um, it was just a very, very um, traumatic experience, especially to do it alone. Um, but yeah, that's my story. And uh, it's the first time I've ever really shared it with anyone, but it truly, at the time, it took me a long time to realize that um, I didn't deserve to be treated like that. Um, I thought that I was supposed to be treated like that, that I deserved that, but I didn't. Um, my hopes for um, any healthcare professionals or anyone out there, um, is that these hospital, these nurses and staff would be more empathetic and compassionate and recognize that I was there by myself and I had no one. But yeah, that's all. I'm now I'm a better person. Um, I'm working on my adoption and I'm just trying to move forward and I'm grateful for experiences that I've had because now I get to share them with people like you guys. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Katina, for sharing your, your story. And we care for you in this time and hold space for you right now. Now we'll hear from Ms. Brittany Wright. Wow, that was such a, a powerful um, and um, uh, beautiful and, and heartbreaking experience. Thank you so much for sharing, Katana. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Brittany L. Wright. Um, I am a social impact strategist. I have uh, a company called Gray Matter in which I've been doing work within the Black maternal health space. Um, my company has been in existence for six years now, but we made a, a pivot into health equity um, for a few reasons. And, and so we've been at that for about two and a half years now. Um, the pivot came for a few reasons. Um, one, I became a new mother and wanted to be at home with my baby. And so I just wanted to pivot our business structure and to go under a new name. And, uh, you know, the gray matter in my body had been shifting so much. And I was very curious about the point of connection uh, within my own body. Um, and the gray matter within my body. And so we, we rebranded with this um, health equity focus of, of doing social impact strategy work. Um, 
But beyond wanting to be at home with my daughter, I was having some unique health experiences in my postpartum journey. Um, I am originally born and raised in the Twin Cities. Um, I've actually known uh, Dr. Moore pretty much my entire life. Uh, and when I was seven and a half months pregnant, I moved across the country to Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, I researched for the last trimester of my pregnancy, essentially, uh, which medical institution was the least likely to let my baby and I die. Um, and as you all probably know, there is no algorithm to help you figure that out as a black mother. And so I had amazing care here in the state of Minnesota um, and, uh, just was so anxious about if I would survive childbirth. And I, it got to the point where um, I had to just come to terms with the fact that uh, bringing this baby forward was worth risking my life. I knew the disparities about women who looks like me uh, and babies who um, also looked like me. And it was horrifying. Um, still, I went forward and I found um, you know, the best hospital I possibly could. And, you know, at the time I was married and my husband had great insurance. And, and so we, we went through the process and, you know, in spite of his successful career, my successful career, our insurance, our socioeconomic status, uh, when we walked into that hospital, we were just another black couple. Uh, they did not care um, or provide us with any high level of care, even just as human beings. Um, and, and ultimately, uh, I paid delivery, um, I just felt like something was wrong. And I was supposed to deliver at a birthing center, which was across the street from the hospital. And um, I told my husband, just take me to the hospital. I, something is not right. When I got to the hospital, um, I got a wheelchair and they wheeled me up to the labor and delivery ward. Uh, and immediately a nurse asked me to get out and walk. And I explained, you know, I'm in pain, I can't. Um, and she said, well, we need to see just how bad your pain is. Um, and so that was the first moment when something went off in my head, something is not right here. Um, so they then um, forced me to walk from the, the hallway into the bed. Um, and I, you know, asked for an epidural because I felt like something was wrong. Um, and they simply diminished it to like, well, you're just not used to childbirth. So, you know, nothing is wrong. Uh, but something was wrong. And in fact, in about my 20th hour of labor, I developed a fever. Um, I felt very physically cold, which led to convulsing, um, which led to chills, which led to convulsing, and I lost control of my body. Um, my ex-husband called for a nurse to come and help me, and they were able to give me some medicine via IV almost immediately. And that essentially saved my life. Um, and I am um, so thankful for that experience um, because it led me to this journey that I'm on today. Um, I was stable, um, stable enough to deliver, although I still had the fever. My daughter was born with the fever. And when I went to my six week postpartum checkup, I was told uh, that everything was fine. Um, you know, you had some complications during labor and delivery, but everything in fact was not fine. Um, I returned to that same medical institution 56 times within the first year of my daughter's life with a host of complications uh, that did not exist before I became pregnant. And so um, that was such an eye-opening moment for me about what it is like to be in a Black birthing body and to navigate a healthcare system um, that is built on racial bias in so many different ways, right? And so I created this framework called Holistic Maternal Care, um, which is a framework of tenets, beliefs, and ideologies that speak to how we should provide care for Black women within the medical system to address Black infant and maternal mortality and morbidity. Um, it talks about listening to Black women, centering the narrative and experience of those um, who are the patients, right? Uh, honoring the historical trauma of those who have been uh, not just personally impacted by their experiences navigating the healthcare system and having unique experiences within their body, uh, but also navigating the um, 
navigating their historical trauma as well, making sure that there are medical institutions that center Black women in their outreach and medical campaigns, acknowledging that they know these disparities exist and that they're going to do something proactively to address them, uh, ensuring that there are policies that we advocate for that allow for um, women like myself, Black women, to give birth and to be cared for and to be safe. Um, and to make sure that there is media, because my background is in is in digital media, uh, making sure that we are intentionally shifting the way society listens to, talks to, and treats Black women, right? And so making sure that we are proactive in shifting bias both internally within the trainings that happen within these medical institutions, but also externally with society as a whole. Uh, Black women have often been disregarded. We've been known as the mules of uh, the world and and you know, have carried every negative stereotype under the sun. And we know that we're so much more than that, right? And so what does it look like to intentionally create media that starts shifting the way that society looks at us and views us and treats us? And so um, through that, uh, I've been able to create uh, the Trill Moms podcast. It is a podcast uh, that centers Black women and the narrative and experience of us through an unapologetic and unfiltered lens, unpacking motherhood, decolonizing motherhood. Uh, we have created a doula training and certification program uh, called Doula Right Thing, which we are developing um, under the guidance uh, and support of the African American Leadership Forum um, and their Community Harvest uh, consultants. And then we are also uh, in the process of constructing the Holistic Maternal Care Center, which will be um, a birthing center we're hoping in the city of St. Paul uh, that'll be constructed that focuses on Black women, and that will be supported uh, by the Finnovation Lab for Social Entrepreneurship be working over the next nine months to get the uh, the framework, the, the funding and the foundation um, and the real estate of the birthing center together through the support of the Finnovation Lab. Um, the podcast will continue uh, now, now that we're kind of off hiatus and um, our doula training and certification program ideally will be developed by the end of the year. So um, that is my work and how I come to the space. I am still recovering from giving birth to my daughter, although that was two and a half years ago. Um, but I am so thankful for the experiences that I had because if it had not been for the trauma of her birth and my postpartum experience, um, I wouldn't have gone down this path and been able to do the work that I do, including uh, working with Representative Richardson and being able to testify on her bill, HF 660, which is the Dignity in Pregnancy Childbirth Act, which was just signed into law. So um, incredibly honored to be here with you all and to, to be in this fight together. Thank you, Brittany and Katina, for sharing your stories and your powerful work with and in community to bring more awareness to Black maternal health. Now we will have a presentation by Dr. LaVon Moore. She'll share a little bit more about herself as I get her presentation ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? It's a pleasure um, to be a part of the panel today. It certainly was wonderful to hear um, those powerful stories, the work that continues to be um, done in the community and um, also reinforces the need for us to connect um, and know what other people are doing and um, what's happening in the community so that we um, can spread the word regarding resources as well as um, avoid duplication in services. So just awesome presentations today. Good to see Brittany. Um, um, she's all grown up now and it's just awesome to see that. I am Dr. Um, LaVon Moore. I am a nurse midwife, um, a board certified um, women's healthcare nurse practitioner and lactation consultant and um, actually um, newly um, um, admitted fellow in the Academy of Certified Nurse Midwives. So it's just awesome to be with everyone today um, and to be a part of this discussion. Um, I was asked to share a little bit about um, um, my work in um, 
my um, experience around this topic. And so I'm going to just start off with, you know, I just really appreciated the historical perspective that was provided by Ruth Richardson. It was so rich in information, um, just talking about the, you know, the history of the medical establishment and the medical apartheid is what it reminds me of in our conversations. Um, and so I just want to share a little bit, and Nicole, when you're ready, um, slide wise. Thank you. So um, we can go to the next slide there. Um, I am um, founder and owner of Chosen Vessels Midwifery Services, which um, provides um, services to women that include um, breastfeeding. And um, our cultural care model is our chocolate milk club, which I'll talk about a little bit later. I also do OBGYN and at, um, at North Point Health and Wellness Center, where I continue to provide um, prenatal care as well as um, GYN and well women care um, for women in our community. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about um, the role, I guess, in terms of breastfeeding, um, in terms of the solution. We heard a lot about the problems, and unfortunately, we had heard some pretty powerful stories of birth um, experiences that did not go on the way we would have liked. And so in this work of looking at Black maternal health and infant mortality, um, I just am reminded that breastfeeding is a tool um, here to eliminate health disparities, to address some of the social determinants of health impacts. It impacts chronic diseases that disproportionately affect us. Um, and um, it also impacts infant mortality and mater maternal morbidity. As you can see, postpartum hemorrhage, SIDS is an issue as well. And it helps with out the data, I hear the stories, and I hear the history, um, my mind goes to solutions. And so um, next, um, the um, issue of what can we do um, really um, frames the work that I do because I really believe the people closest to the problem are the people closest to the solution. Um, so um, as you move on, Nicole, thank you. Um, there's no doubt that African-American women, our experiences are reflected through the distinct historical lens of slavery and racial hatred, which casts particular meanings on our bodies and has impacted um, our breastfeeding. Next. Um, there's no, no qualm about that. Everyone can agree about that history and how important that is. Um, because we know that breastfeeding, which is a solution, I believe, to some of the issues around infant mortality and maternal morbidity. Breastfeeding is a cultural practice that takes place within the context of family and community and is a solution, a solution to some of this. Um, continue. You know, and how, you know, when we look at that historical piece and how things have changed and how that has impacted our birthing, um, I look at it in ways, what I consider the ways, the food ways, the living ways, the birthing ways, and the feeding ways, and how they have culturally shifted and changed, and how that has impacted. And then, so when we take a holistic approach to looking at women, working with women, talking about women, um, one of that, those ways is to look at you know, our food ways and to understand how that impacts our birth outcomes. Um, historically, you hear a lot, a lot of negatives about the um, African-American diet, which, not, which is not accurate because um, historically we did have um, a much better diet than that we see now, right? Um, we talk about being enslaved where diet was very minimalized. You might be, you know, pieces of um, salt pork and cornmeal rationed out on a limited diet. But if we were lucky to be in a place where we were, had access to um, be able to have our own um, gardens, um, then we would have fresh produce um, that was available to us, um, that was homegrown. And we realized that um, because of the work of enslaved people, those vegetables um, had to be prepared in a way that allowed them to cook while we were away working. And that was done um, and produced 
what we call pot liquors or, or greens and other vegetables that stewed and created nutritional broths that were very helpful. Well, a lot of the food was prepared fresh from the garden as we were um, have moved through time and had access to it. We had more plant-based diets, very little meat. Um, meat was actually um, something that was um, reserved for Sundays or those special gatherings are small amounts in various foods for seasoning. So it was a much healthier diet, beans, greens, um, cornbread, plant-based products um, in terms of all of the various vegetables, squash and things that are available to us. And now what we see um, that I think may be contributing to some of those shifts in our um, maternal outcomes is lots of processed foods, lots of prepackaged foods and lots of fast foods where you can't control salt, um, has little nutrition um, and those are con things are contributing to those outcomes. And let's talk about the living ways as well. I think that also impacts um, maternal outcomes. And so how we lived historically was in much more intergenerational living. So you had the elders in the household with you. So you had that wisdom. Um, in terms of, you know, um, being pregnant and how to rear children and what you should and should not eat and should and should not do. And so when we've moved and um, acculturated to more of the practice of living um, independently, um, often younger people moving to different states alone, away from family and friends for various jobs and vocational opportunities, that impacts how we birth. Um, our birthing ways have changed. Um, where we birth and with whom we birth has changed, right? Um, historically, we birthed in the home with midwives, and that has shifted to hospitals and OBGYNs. And with that shift has come a change of our outcomes. Um, and then our feeding ways have changed. Um, we historically did breastfeed our babies and breastfed others' babies as well. And because of the change um, in how we view the care, right, that belief that midwifery care because of propaganda was not the same quality MD care as well as formula um, being used by the affluent and we associating um, breastfeeding with poverty and less affluent and in, in, in that it was more healthier to have formula, we changed the way we fed our children. And so all of these things um, have, those shifts have caused us to, um, be impacted in terms of our outcomes. Nicole? So let's talk a little bit more about solution. So I just put that up. I don't know if people can see that well, but that's Chosen Vessels Midwifery Services and our Chocolate Milk Club. And the Chocolate Milk Club um, was developed as a solution um, to the what I was seeing around um, infant mortality and maternal outcomes. Um, I was concerned about what can we do in our community um, to improve our um, birth outcomes, to improve our um, um, infant mortality outcomes. And so one of the things in the research that I looked at was breastfeeding. Breastfeeding, uh, we had low initiation rates and low continuation rates of breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is, as I indicated early in this presentation, an, a wonderful tool that addresses so many of the issues that impact us. And it was an underutilized tool um, that one has of their own. And, and so I developed a program called the Chocolate Mill Club, which is a support program for African-American women in the community to support them in breastfeeding. We wanna help women to initiate breastfeeding and to continue to breastfeed as long as possible. Because what I found is that um, because of the lack of role models, because of our change in our breastfeeding ways, we did not always see women um, breastfeeding. So we didn't necessarily have role models for breastfeeding in the community anymore. We also um, found that Black women said they wanted to breastfeed, but no one provided education and support that there was an assumption that they did not want to. So the goal of the Chocolate Milk Club is to, to provide that support for women, regardless of their ability to pay. Um, and that support includes um, membership within our club, okay, um, regular um, gatherings and support in various ways, providing support services and support circles that could be breastfeeding, education, it could be other issues that, as we address the whole woman. Um, 
we have monthly mix it up Mondays. We have um, um, our annual chocolate milk club event to promote breastfeeding in a larger community as well. So that you can see all this chocolate milk coming together that women who often are isolated and in silos can see there are more breastfeeding people out here. So there are models for breastfeeding out here that we can um, connect with. And we also um, offer annually. So if there's anyone out there today that has someone that they would like to nominate for our Rhonda Spears White Award, um, we'd really appreciate hearing from you as um, we um, provide a Rhonda Spears White Award yearly to um, activists in the community um, who are continuing to do the work of reclaiming the cultural practice in our community of breastfeeding and helping women to do so. So the Chocolate Mill Club also has peer support. We do home visits to see women because that was one of the things that is very important to see where women are breastfeeding and they're breastfeeding at home. So how can we assess their needs um, over the phone um, which many other programs do. So we do home visits and provide that continual support to them. Um, if they are currently breastfeeding or if they were breastfeeding in the past, they still have the opportunity to participate with us because we believe that the women who, right, under we've kind of used, I shouldn't say kind of, but we use the Ubuntu philosophy, women who have breastfed in the past are our spokespeople. They are ambassadors to help spread the word in the community. Um, so we have our breastfeeding ambassadors who are still involved with us, who are former breastfeeding moms. We have our breastfeeding peers, as I um, indicated. And we also have the Chocolate Milk Council. And the Chocolate Milk Council are women. Um, I see Sierra is here, Sierra Williams, Tanisha um, Williams, um, Hadija, are women who are breastfeeding. Mothers currently are breastfed in the past who assist um, um, with and run the Chocolate Mill Club um, collectively. So they are part of the council that helps me determine programming um, and other things, support things that we need for our moms and support our moms in the community. So it is a for us, by us solution to some of the things that we're talking about today as we're remembering that breastfeeding is a tool to eliminate health disparities. Um, it can address social determinants of health. It does impact chronic disease that disproportionately affects us. It can um, be an important part of the solution for infant mortality and maternal morbidity. We still know that postpartum hemorrhage is the number one cause of death in the world for um, pregnant moms. And we also know that we are concerned about SIDS and for some reason there is an increase in SIDS and breastfeeding is a tool for that. We also are concerned about mental wellness for moms. So postpartum Depression is a very present and real problem in that um, breastfeeding is a mediator for that. So it can help with that. So when we talk about all the issues that have occurred, um, we know as part of clinicians that it is important as some of the women have indicated to talk to women, um, to hear what they have to say um, and be able to respond to those needs. Chocolate Mill Club is an example of doing that. Um, and so um, I just wanted to, um, share that because we really believe that chocolate milk does a baby good, that it's important for the health of the mom and the baby um, going forward to prevent um, infant mortality and address maternal morbidity. So that's just kind of my overall spiel um, regarding that. Is there any questions? Thank you, Dr. Moore, and thank you all of our speakers for sharing your powerful stories, your wisdom with us. And now we will turn it over to Ms. Najoycia Elmore, who will assist moderation for questions. Thank you. Um, I would like to follow up and say thank you for your time today, Dr. Moore, and really addressing how breastfeeding, especially for the African-American community, can assist in reducing a lot of these health disparities that we are seeing. Um, one of the first questions that we have is, what advocacy skills can we instruct Black people to advocate in the care of their delivery? And that question is directed to the entire panel or myself? Yes, I'm sorry. I think that can be directed to you, Dr. Moore, um, Katina, if you are still present, um, and also Ruth, if she wants to join in on the panel as well. 
Well, first of all, I do want to just add one more comment before we continue on. Um, is to one to access the resources that are available um, because there are some really great resources, things that exist in our community that are happening at the you know boots down level. We have perinatal cope training. We have women and men in the community, doula dads, doula moms who have been trained um, and are working in various agencies to support women. We have um, diva moms in St. Paul that is there to support women around pregnancy. Um, we also have Beck who's doing great work in St. Paul around um, prenatal care. So there are a lot of resources in the community that need to be accessed. I'm always advocating for the work that we do here as well at North Point because we do um, provide lots of support services. We have um, the iChirp group here. We also have, because we have um, um, resources, um, we, um, in terms of human resources, as well as medical care, we're kind of a one-stop shop campus. So we do have um, food shelf and other social services available for people who need them. And then we also have medical care. And then we have OB care coordination care in the medical area. And we have um, iChirp who has the empowerment program for pregnant moms, African-American moms specifically on the human resources side. So we have um, a large um, mix of resources available in that one site, but in the community, um, the cultural wellness center, there's all kinds of things happening. So this, this is really great because we get an opportunity to hear about some of the things that are new and emerging um, as well as some of the things that already exist. And it's a great way for us to connect so we're not duplicating resources that we can also as African-Americans band together to create and generate more revenue for, for um, or the resources that exist. Because a lot of us are doing this work because we have a passion, we've done our research around this work and we're coming back and serving our community regardless of the ability for our community to pay. But, it, but when it comes to funding, that doesn't always happen. So one of the things in terms of moms, I'm going to get back to your question here. That was a long way around it um, of, <laughs> of self-advocacy is that one, we need to show up for ourselves. Um, and I really appreciate the stories um, that were shared because we do need to advocate for ourselves. We do need to do our re research and do our reading and research. We do need to understand that um, our outcomes are better. Um, when served with people who look like ourselves. Um, also, we need, to, we need to show up for our appointments. We need to show up and read and, and, and get engaged, put some skin in the game in our own care. I guess my thing is do not expect anybody else to care more about your health than you do. Um, and then as providers, um, you know, we have to slow down and listen. Um, and hear what people are saying. And as a provider of color who does OBGYN, one of the things that I'm always um, thankful for, for is the honesty of women that um, I serve in the community and their openness um, to share their lives with me and allow me to enter into this special moment in such a very intimate way. Um, but we do um, have a great opportunity to impact people's lives in the role that we have because we do have a long period of time to be with them um, as a provider. And I think as doulas and other support persons, um, it's really important because of the length of time that we have to get to know people, to be able to, to help and support and provide education um, is really important. Thank you. <clears throat> I have a, another question. Well, I'll say, does Katina or Ruth want to respond to that question at all before moving forward? Okay. Um, a question for the chat, and this is also directed at you, Dr. Moore, um, or centered around your thoughts um, about the effect and lack of paid leave during the first six to 12 weeks after a baby is born um, on initiation and continuation of breastfeeding. Well, there is certainly a need for our um, policies to change. And so we do need to be involved at the legislative level to help some of that happen um, so that we can get paid leave for mothers in this country. Um, because it is a challenge to return to work, um, but it's not, um, 
it does not prevent women from being able to breastfeed, but they do need extra support. That's just one of those challenging times. It's kind of like that initiation, getting people started, right? Because breastfeeding is always say it's natural, but not always easy. So they need that support. We need to make sure during that critical first couple of weeks period where people often can fall off that they don't. And then the next critical period after they have um, begun breastfeeding successfully is that return to work time. And because many women of color often return to work a lot sooner, we talk about six weeks, that's kind of a luxury, right? Many women have to return to work sooner. Um, and so just having the support in place um, to help them during those critical times is really important. So all those support people that are around, right? They have doulas, they have medical providers, and all of them need to make sure that they are connected in their community with support that is going to help them to continue um, in the postpartum period with successful breastfeeding. So it's that continuation. And the research has proven if you get a good start in the hospital, if you're gonna breastfeed, see a, a lactation consultant in the hospital before you leave, but those people need to make sure you're connected to a support service in the community for follow-up. So it's again, that follow-up and that continuation of care that impacts. Um, those things, breastfeeding as well as just prenatal care. Having that continuation and good support is just key. I would just and go. employers, thank you. I want to say one more thing is that employers, um, there's laws that um, are in place for breastfeeding and to protect breastfeeding in the workplace, but they're not always um, supported by the employer. But make sure you ask your provider for a letter to send to your employer. Um, there are the laws that you can pull off and we can attach it to that letter to send to your employees. You're, you're entitled to breaks to breastfeed. You're entitled to be able to breastfeed in a place that's not a toilet um, and those kinds of things. So um, talk to your providers and talk to your support people. You know, the, um, the doulas in the community, um, they are trained in basic breastfeeding education and support. So talk to your support people. And the key is to get people connected with support and the resources that they need to have a healthy pregnancy and postpartum period. And I would just add, you know, just building upon what Dr. Murr was saying, because she talked about six weeks being a luxury for most people. And I think that that's really important because when we look at the data that comes out of the Department of Labor, 25% um, of women return to work within uh, 10 days of giving birth. Mm -hmm. So there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a huge segment of our society that don't have that, um, that, that ability to access uh, leave and the individuals most likely to not have access to paid family or medical leave is uh, black families, indigenous families and Latinx mm -hmm. families. And so when we think mm -hmm. about the safety nets that have been built, they have been built with uh, huge holes in them uh, mm -hmm. that uh, families that look like ours are often uh, falling through. And when we think about sort of that legacy of the safety net with holes, and we think about our systems working the way that they were designed, we can even look back even further, looking back in the 1930s when social security came into play because when social security uh, came into play, it was designed to ensure that um, uh, individuals who uh, identified as farmers or domestics, they were not allowed to get social security. And so that meant that over 60% of black people were kept out. And so as we think about the way that our systems work, oftentimes the people who have access to paid family leave are the people who are most likely able to take a leave without having access uh, to paid family leave. And so um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a critical component and it relates not only to uh, improving outcomes with breastfeeding, but it also impacts maternal mortality and infant mortality as well. Thank you. Um, another question is, and this is to the whole panel, what would you say to Black women who know about these disparities and have a lot of fear about pregnancy and giving birth? I let the other ladies answer for first. Katina, did you want to say something? Uh, 
I'm not oh, sure. Well. I don't, I'm not sure if she's having a problem uh, getting uh, on. Uh, un, unmuted. So, Dr. Moore, if you if you'd like to start, and I can. Okay. Um, well, um, I think um, again, who people have care by impacts their um, anxiety and fear. So, I I I always tell patients, you know, I'm biased. I'm a midwife, and so um, if a woman is low risk, healthy woman. Um, and does not need um, MD care, then one of the ways that I think will help to decrease that risk or that anxiety and fear that one may have is who their care provider is. So I think midwifery care is, is certainly um, an important part of relieving that anxiety that women and fear that women have is because it's a different philosophy and approach. Um, we need our physicians for high-risk women and women that need um, intervention, but those who are low risk, healthy pregnancies, um, I think midwifery care, which looks at pregnancy as a normal physiological process, provides lots of education and support during pregnancy and um, very on hands during um, labor and catching that infant as the mom is delivering, right? We're just catching, um, I think is important. So I think that that type of care is important. Women engaging and in, in reading, um, making sure that they have knowledge on board helps to alleviate fear as well. Thank you. And I know we're at time, so I can maybe close things uh, out for us. But, um, uh, you know, I, I think it's really important. Um, and I know that uh, Brittany had to step away, but she talked about that fear and that, mm -hmm. that she had as she was um, uh, expecting. And she's not alone in that. And when you begin to, to, to realize just, just how um, the impacts of racism, how deeply and how painful it is, not just historically, because we can still feel that pain contemporary today, um, what should be uh, a joyous event. Mm -hmm has become one that's filled with um, so much anxiety and so much stress. And um, I, I was talking to my, uh, my, my cousin, uh, Keandra's mom, uh, mm -hmm. before this presentation, and she talked about with her other daughter and her pregnancy, she's like, I couldn't enjoy it because I was so fearful and I was so afraid of what could possibly, uh, of what could possibly happen. And so we don't, we don't talk a lot about that piece, mm -hmm. but that is also work that needs to be done within our community. And it's also just a, a recognition that um, respite and rest is a form of resistance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Having mm -hmm. joy is a form of resistance. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and there has to be that work to find joy um, uh, in the midst of some, some, some really troubling uh, circumstances. So um, I know that we're at time uh, and I just want to thank everyone for sharing space with us today and to have some difficult conversations, to hear some difficult truths, but to also hear some very important ideas and strategies. Um, and uh, Dr. Moore, I appreciate your, um, your, your uh, efforts and all the work that you're doing and the strategies that you're ensuring that those who are closest to the pain of this issue are closest uh, to the solutions. Uh, Katina, thank you for being so honest and for being so open and so vulnerable with us uh, today. And um, I just wanna say uh, that you did not deserve that treatment and your story is going to help others to know that they don't deserve that treatment either. So thank you so much. And I can't leave without thanking Joy and Nicole for all of the work and all of the organizing that they did behind the scenes to make this happen. We're gonna have um, uh, many more uh, topics coming out soon. So stay tuned. Uh, and we'll also make sure that you get uh, a copy of this uh, recording for you to share as well. Thank you all for sharing space with us. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.